good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me here today. Um, I hope after the 20 minutes that I talk, you'll have a little more insight into how a big corporation uh, is dealing with this uh, hyped up technology. Um, it's a little disarming having this many lights on you, by the way. I uh, can hardly see any of you. Um, uh, sorry, do I think I have a clicker? Good. So um, uh, this topic is talked about, it seems like, everywhere. And uh, the team and I, uh, 10 of us or so, it's almost impossible to keep up with everything that's happening around blockchain or decentralized ledger technology. Um, every day it seems that some company is doing a new thing, an ICO is launching, uh, a lot of discussion about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. So I think the first thing that we had to distill was we have to separate between actually two hype cycles, a hype cycle around the cryptocurrencies uh, and then what enterprises and companies want to do with the technology. Um, on the one hand, uh, you have this absolutely fascinating thing blossoming in the world where um, all kinds of actors are involved with uh, cryptocurrencies and this speculative thing that's happening. People are making investments and it, it draws in all kinds of people. Uh, what, what we love about it is behind all of that are technologists, engineers, uh, developing software code. And we think, how can we use that may sound boring, but how do we use that to make systems more efficient? Um, how can we increase profit margins, uh, etc.? So um, what we do is we look at these attributes of blockchain. And if you think about building software, you might say to yourself, why do we need this? We have very advanced database technology. We can store data today in all kinds of ways. And we have very fast processing, very low latency to access data from all kinds of devices over all kinds of networks. But you can take each one of these attributes and you can think, ah, is it important to have no central point of failure in my software? Is it important that maybe some bits of data are immutable uh, or transparent? Um, if you want to remove the middle entity, and you want to disintermediate, is that important to you? How does that make the software you work on better, faster, more scalable, et cetera? Um, so we are a large company. We're a telco. We have probably hundreds of software systems that we could always be innovating on. Uh, we also provide IT infrastructure for massive companies, Bosch, Siemens, Daimler, the car companies, just in Germany alone. But actually, we have a global presence, over 100,000 people in our IT staff uh, building and supplying infrastructure, not just uh, wireless connectivity. So uh, when I talk about this internally to the management of Deutsche Telekom, who want to understand this technology and how we can use it, this is the first thought I try to put into their mind. Somewhere around 26 years ago, everybody started getting very excited about the internet and what we call the data highway was born. And we were able to exchange data between two disparate entities over networks. 10 years ago, social networks really blew up. And not only could you exchange simple data, but now you could exchange video. And you could do many-to-many -many relationships. And new business models were born where you could sell advertising much more fluidly and on a much grander scale. Uh, now we have blockchain which a lot of people might say is about trust and the trust highway. And maybe using smart contracts is that killer app that maybe some people in this room are thinking about diving into and building some software around. Um, I think that last uh, thing under impact, though, about the machine economy, uh, that's where an infrastructure company like Deutsche Telekom starts getting a little bit more excited about this technology and starts diving into it like our team has. So um, as the team has gotten together over the last few months and we sit down and talk about why would we use it, here are some reasons why. And I have to go get budget from somebody and start spending money, hiring resources, writing code. And so we have some gates we have to pass through. Um, 
What does it mean to build more trust? What are some, where are some places where we could use most, more trust in the software we build, the relationships we have, the business models that we support? Are we able to make operations more efficient? Are we actually able to bring a new business model to the market, um, et cetera? Uh, and of course, I think the fourth item there is uh, one of the more interesting ones. I think telecom probably has easily over 25 or 30 different user management systems that we as employees alone have to use. Um, and imagine that our customers also get frustrated with, with identification. So that's an area that we think about. So uh, our focus as a team, um, uh, I'm a leader in the innovation team here in Berlin. It's called T-Labs, Deutsche Telekom Innovation Labs. We're located uh, in the TU Berlin building in Ernst Reuter Platz. And we have a very tight integration with TU Berlin for those that, uh, of you that aren't familiar with us. Um, there's a couple hundred of us uh, between telecom employees and TU researchers and doctors and, and professors, and often we work together on research. Uh, they think more about publishing, we think more about commercialization. Sometimes it works out really well, it's good. And we can support each other. Um, but there's two things that the team and I are, are working on when it comes to what are we gonna do with blockchain? What are we gonna do with this technology? So the first item here is core system design. So we have set up nodes running on Bitcoin, Ethereum, Blockstack, IOTA. I think we might join uh, the Sovereign Network, which is uh, a ledger out of the US. And how do they all perform? What kind of machines do you need? What happens to these machines over time as you're, as you're once you bootstrap in and download a ledger and start making uh, transactions and, and whatnot? So, and we have a thesis, though, or a hunch, maybe I would say, that the currently available systems won't meet the needs of an enterprise or our enterprise customers. Um, and I'll talk a little bit uh, about that in a moment. So that's one thing that we are for sure working on. Uh, maybe we create our own ledger. Maybe we copy and paste the Bitcoin code. Maybe we take one of the hyper ledger um, frameworks and we use that. We're not sure yet. Uh, I don't know where we'll end up but that's the path we're on for system design. And then uh, in terms of application development, um, how does a telco use this technology? There's a couple of things I think that are very obvious. Um, millions of IoT devices are gonna be hitting our network over the next few years. Actually, they already are on our network, so many of them. And if I were a cybersecurity expert, I could probably talk for hours about how horrible that is and how many threats that brings to our network. Um, but I'm not that person. Uh, but we still care about it, and so we're thinking, uh, if you think back to some of those words that describes the features of blockchain, how can we um, protect our network more from all of these devices that are gonna hit it? Uh, you may be familiar that we are now rolling out narrowband IoT. It's, um, it's another way to connect into our network that's kind of rolled out just for devices so that machine economy can start happening. Uh, how do we know that all those devices coming onto our network are friendly? Uh, maybe we want them to be authenticated first, and maybe we do that authentication through ledger technology. Um, the second thing we, we work on, um, you may not be familiar with what happens in the background, but whenever you're roaming with your device, voice, text, or data, let's say you go to Austria or you're the United States, well, in the background of all that interchange of what you're doing on your device, our company has contracts with hundreds of other telcos around the world. We call this wholesale roaming. And it's a very uh, complex set of contracts in many different denominations of money. And there's a lot of inefficiencies. And this is an obvious place to us inside telco that this technology could help us. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what I've put on this slide and then open it up for questions. Um, this is a question poised uh, to me by my management. Um, everybody's heard of Ethereum. Why wouldn't you just start using Ethereum? Why don't you build everything on top of Ethereum? And I say, well, we could. We'll think about it, but let's explore it. We are an R&D lab. Um, but let me go a little bit broader first. Ethereum is definitely something we are testing on. We are building some software on. 
As I mentioned earlier, we have a node set up on Ethereum. And one of the things we've done is we've tried to um, graphically look at every single transaction from the first three years of, a, or first two years of Ethereum. And it's really fascinating to see a graphical representation of that. Uh, I don't have it here, but um, uh, if you ping me, I'd, I'd be happy to share that with you. Um, so Ethereum is something we're looking after. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about um, some of the flaws we think Ethereum has. But um, you may know that all the cloud hosters out there offer blockchain as a service. And uh, I'm not sure what that means yet. Uh, but according to them, it means, please use our hosting. Please pay us for our cloud hosting. And by the way, you can pay us a little more to set up an Ethereum node or a node on one of the other ledgers. Uh, this is my interpretation. That could be wrong, but that mainly seems like what the cloud providers are doing today. But I imagine there's people like me, actually probably many more of them at Microsoft, Google, and Amazon, um, thinking about how to really take that further faster. So it puts a little bit of pressure on us if um, we want to build a business model on top of this. Um, but you know, Oracle and SAP, they also have the same thing. You can Google, look up what they're doing. They all say the same thing, most of the paragraphs. Um, and then Hyperledger, if you're, if you're not familiar with it, it's a part of the Linux Foundation set up to um, build a community around open source software and, and uh, blockchain technologies. I think today there are five, four or five um, ledger systems available for anybody to go use and build upon. And then there's a lot of toolkits. Um, if you're cynical, you might say, well, that's really a place for IBM to build business, set up their framework, and then you know, put a fee on top of building a, a blockchain system on top of that. Very private one. Um, but we're starting to come to a conclusion that none of this really is going to fit what we want to do with, with Ledger. And that's why we're putting time and effort into it. Um, so I, we put this together just to give an idea of uh, how we, w we currently view Ethereum. And by the way, I, I, I think it's a brilliant system. But I also have to be responsible for service level agreements. Uh, and we get charged if things go down. And I think if you spend a little time investigating Ethereum, you'll see that maybe you don't want to build an enterprise system on top of it, put some SLAs onto it, and provide it as a hosted service. Um, I do know that there's lots of people coding and making it better by the day, and maybe it gets to a point where you really can feel that it's reliable. I think I was just about to talk about the first thing that, that we find problematic about using Ethereum. <coughs> or a ledger where there is a token that is used for two reasons. Uh, I think it's used um, maybe primarily today, at least in the public's eye, as an asset, as a speculative asset, and the price is fluctuating. But it's also a utility, and you need this token in order to use the network. And if you've studied it for a while now, I mean, it's, it, it's not having exponential growth in its cost like Bitcoin is, but it still has a cost. And it still is primarily used, uh, from our opinion, as a speculative asset um, today. And Bitcoin, in particular, is a speculative asset. I think if you followed it this last week, it went from 7,500 US dollars down to 6,000. And today, I think, as of right now, it's right back up. So if you were paying for transactions on that, your cost of transactions is going up and down. And that's, that's a problem if you're going to be putting millions of transactions into a system. Um, and some may argue that it's actually not that slow of a network. But if you think about what if you were going to put 2 billion transactions in a ledger per day, could Ethereum keep up? Well, we're going to find out soon as we try to pound the system and um, uh, find some other things out about that. Um, the regulation here, uh, I, I don't know all the regulation in Germany, but in the US, if you buy a Bitcoin or an Ethereum token, it's like buying a stock and you're responsible for capital gains. So if you buy a token and then you spend the token, are you selling the token? And I don't, you know, we need to come up with an answer for that. Um, if anybody has an opinion on that, I'd, I'd sure like to hear it. Um, so you don't know about your tax liability as an enterprise. As an individual who's doing it investment, it might come natural to you to be considering capital gains taxes. Um, but it's something that we need to be considerate of. Um, 
I think maybe um, the second to last item under general, the denial of service, uh, there was the issue with parity recently, which was on the fringe of Ethereum, it wasn't the network itself, but it makes you wonder a little bit about what actors are out there and what are they trying to do to break into the systems around Ethereum. And if we were using it and a partner of ours somehow got broken into, would we be liable for that? Would they hold us liable? Would they bring us to court? Anyway, these are considerations we have as an enterprise. Um, the language that's used for the smart contract, uh, I'm not a computer scientist, I can't comment on the strength of it, but I've been told that maybe there's a better way to approach it, maybe with um, a more commonly used language that more people are aware of. Uh, but that's something that we also will, are exploring here and in other ledger systems. Um, so that wraps, out the, uh, wraps up the presentation uh, portion of the talk. And uh, I'd love to hear from anybody if anybody had any questions about the work we're doing, why we're doing it, or anything about blockchain as a fundamental infrastructure component. Yeah. I can't hear you, I'm sorry. Hello. Yeah. Uh, you talked about the blockchain ledger system as in general being transparent and secure and everything. The fact that there are many ledgers out there or many service providers, not just the big uh, players like Microsoft's uh, IBM's Oracle, etc. There are small providers as well. How does that make it secure or how does it boost the confidence level of an enterprise or say a group of companies going out there and selecting it? Because if you go for any big player, you're potentially going to be paying big bucks as well. So how does it make a difference, or what, are these, what, are, what is the criteria of selection of a certain blockchain provider? I think I um, can answer that. I envision, uh, well, when I talk to people who are customers in the enterprise, and you think back over the last 10 years of how cloud systems have developed, right? It's amazing. Today, um, I, who have very little infrastructure, um, experience can get onto a website, hit some buttons, put in my payment information, and boom. I have scalable, world-class infrastructure for building applications, and I think that's amazing. And it uh, doesn't cost too much. And there's competition there. Uh, we see five years from now, maybe, I can go to a same similar experience, hit a few buttons, and boom, I participate in a ledger system and it will show me an SLA that I can count on. The cost structure will be knowable and predictable because um, you know, when, generally when you build software in a big company, you spend a lot of time planning for it. Um, and I don't mean writing the software, I mean what's the business model you're gonna do? How much revenue is gonna come in in the first year, second year, whatnot? So predictable cost is a component as well. Um, so I think my answer is trying to get to, I believe that Ledger systems will be prolific. There will be competition. Um, maybe Deutsche Telekom comes out with an enterprise ledger system with its own technology, or we sit on top of some known ledgers, something like that. So bringing the robustness, scalability, cost modeling out to enterprise customers, I think, would be the goal for companies like us, for Microsoft, for AWS, et cetera. You here in the second row? It was a, it was a great talk, thank you. Um, thank do you. you have any blockchain applications in production at T-Mobile? And no. if not, what do you envision in the next five to 10 years? Some um, business cases? Yeah, I'll reference what I just said. Um, we provide IT infrastructure for lots of companies around the world. Why wouldn't we provide ledger-based infrastructure for companies, right? So that's one answer to your question. I think we will also be building systems to help us internally. Um, but in terms of products facing the outside world, I don't know. I don't know yet. Um, we're kind of concentrating on the core system design that I talked about earlier, and then some applications internally to make things easier to operate. Given how new the industry is and the lack of credentials, how are you doing your recruiting for your team? I'm sorry, how am I doing what? 
recruiting for your team? How do you, ah. how do you look at who to bring in? Yeah, good question. We actually have two open positions right now for engineers who want to work on blockchain. If anybody's curious, please look me up. Um, I think in Berlin, we're going to have a very difficult time bringing in specialists. Uh, number one, um, if you're not already aware, Berlin is like, to me, ground zero of startups for blockchain. I think uh, our team has cataloged at least 90 startups in Berlin or in the surrounding area that are somehow working on blockchain. Um, maybe there's places like in California that might have more in aggregate. I don't know. I'll still make the argument, though, because I want people to come here and work. Um, nobody is an expert yet, so that's the other part of the equation. I think there is a limited supply of engineers that we could hire, uh, and mainly it's engineers that we need. But also, everybody's gaining expertise right now. Um, is there something more specific, though, that you head to that? What are you looking for? You oh, what are we looking for? Um, ambitious, entrepreneurially, entrepreneurially minded people that um, want to have an impact, you know? I'd be happy to, ha uh, we'd be happy to hire engineers who have never touched a ledger system, but show an aptitude and willingness to get on a journey with us, even though we don't know exactly where we're going. Um, and maybe a few UX designers, maybe a product manager or two. Uh, John, how far you are from making a decision to build your own ledger or to use something existing? We are probably six to 12 months out from probably being more comfortable answering that. Uh, what first areas you would want to address with either your own ledger or some existing one? Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for the question. Well, one of the first things we're addressing is um, if you were to sit with me and talk to some of our bigger enterprise clients, they want everything that blockchain offers, but they don't want it to be anonymous, right? They want to know that all the actors involved um, are known, right? So that's one thing that we, we deal with. And, and there's this concept of a privileged ledger, right? Um, so that's one thing that we're addressing. How is that, how is that gracefully handled? How do you really employ the power of decentralization when everybody's known? I don't know if there's a conflict with those two things or not. Uh, I think from a business perspective, I don't think there is. Uh, another thing we're tackling is um, the GDPR is coming up, right? And there's a lot of rules around privacy of individuals' data. And I think maybe there's a time limit on some of it. So could you put personal data into a ledger and maybe at the three-year mark there's a cliff and it just drops off and disappears? I mean, I don't have a problem with that, but uh, maybe it's not pure when you think about blockchain, but there's a few things like that that we're thinking about as we think about core system design. How does it meet the needs of regulation, taxation, et cetera? You know, we have to think of those things. All good? Thank you very much for having me here.